All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. Today we have my favorite day. Today we have our one on one, our open forum. So let's start. <clears throat> so, how is everyone doing? Today we can do whatever. We, we can talk whatever. We can discuss whatever. And we can have fun together. So, Michelle says, here, and Michelle, you are the first one today. Where is Steve? <laughs> Nancy, hello, uh, DDS, third cool bean, welcome, Margaret, welcome, um, Christy Tucker present, thank you, Nancy Camp, Michelle was first tonight, yes, Michelle was first tonight, Margaret, welcome, DDS, France, welcome, um, France says Margaret can't, still can't see you, um, DDS, Susan, Evening crew, evening Bernard, cool beans. Hey, Steve. Steve, hello. Barbara, good day. How are you doing, Barbara? How is Lotus? You should show us show us Lotus picture. Tweet it. Um, Franz says, guys, I pulled a hip muscle a couple of days ago. Need to go lie down. See you, cool beans, soon. Oh, man. Um, feel well soon and see you soon. Uh, almost late was watching Dr. Sam Bailey on glutathione. Very nice. Glutathione is good. Um, Doug says, I don't tweet. Fair. Cher says, I was taking a nap, had an upper GI done today, still feeling sedated. Oh, wow. Hey, Samina, how are you? Um, good evening, Anthony. Hope you're doing well. Melanie, hello. Cool. So let's start. Let's start our discussions. <clears throat> S. Sun says, question, your thoughts on high number of reinfection in Brazil after they seem to be approaching herd immunity, especially in the Manas region. And that was the variant which then ticked them off and said, what the heck happened? And then they saw that there was a variant. So, of course, uh, in this specific case, it seems that it is the variant that is causing reinfections. And if it is correct that variant is causing reinfection, then we have a problem because that means we have a SARS-CoV-3, and that is not good. Although I haven't yet seen the spread of this one as much as we saw with SARS-CoV-2, and it is possible that the variant is actually spreading faster, more, and asymptomatically. And so maybe it is spreading and it is creating another herd immunity while we don't even know and we are catching it. If that is the case, it is a good thing. But if it is causing similar destruction as two, then we have a problem. And again, I don't, don't have a right to call it three. But with the number of reinfections they are reporting from uh, south Af from Brazil, it seems like this has become a new strain, but uh, I'm just, I may be wrong. So Aliji says, is Chinese vaccine effective? Aliji, watch my video from yesterday. I talked about Sinopharm. I'll talk about CanSino later on. At least to answer your question, at least from the data that is out there, it seems to be effective. Can we trust that data? That is a question. Rubinia, welcome. Um, Rubies are red. Welcome. E484K is a problem, so that mutation. Lironlimab. So, of course, my thing from a mechanism point of view, Mag, is that Lironlimab should work. I am still surprised that why has only I have not been able to show that it is working. So it should work. Thank you. So Professor Mulazim Hussain Bukhari, my teacher, thank you very much, sir, for being here. Jim, welcome. Farhan, welcome. And so, ready? Ruby's, it's a, so Ruby says it's not a new strain. Disease progress is not sufficiently changed to become a new strain. Yeah, so the to become a new strain, there are many reasons. For example, is a variant that has become much 
faster in spread can be called new strain if it is faster in spread. Or a variant that has become much more lethal can be caused a new strain if the lethality is significantly different. Or a variant who, which is causing a very different clinical outcome can be a new strain. Or a variant that has a different phenotypical outcomes, meaning it has changed its shape enough that can be called a new strain. So we don't know if it is a strain or not, but if it is causing reinfections altogether, different from the previous one, and it is moving rapidly, then it would be a new strain. I hope it is not. Denise, welcome. And I am sorry, I still haven't looked up the MCAS, which we will. Um, I was just working on this work, uh, the uh, today's questions. Jim, question does have has arsenic in it. I have not heard of that, uh, Jim. So we'll we'll look look that up in a second. I did not hear of that. Okay, so let's start. Uh, <laughs> question. Raida Rihan says, hi, I had COVID from three and a half months. Do I need two shots of vaccine or one is sufficient? Uh, Roida, I think the question is going to be, do you even need one? So if you are going to take one, you can take two as well. They both are going to behave the same way. Because from a shorts point of view, after the infection and recovery, if your health has not changed in general, the immune system is still the same way, then the first shot is also the second shot because you had the infection before. So take both, take none, uh, talk with your doctor. Usually it does not, if your body could take care of the wild type virus, I do not know why doctors keep saying that you must take vaccine. However, if you if it makes you feel better, take it. Because compared to the wild type, the vaccine is like a tiny droplet of spike proteins is nothing. Your body will be fine. So Rubies and Red says B17 has independently generated its own 484K. Very dangerous random mutation selection pressure. Yep, we'll see what happens. Okay, so uh, Greenheart is here as well. So welcome, Greenheart. Let's start. There is another question. So before I go to uh, Twitter, there are questions here. Um, Roller Girl, welcome. I just saw a question. Uh, Reni Desh says, why is it that my bowels won't move? Normally, I have diarrhea, but since COVID, it's no go. And the bloating and sick to my stomach. Sorry. <clears throat> so we know that COVID causes gastroenteritis. Now, uh, what is exactly the kind of damage it is causing? That is something you should talk with your gastroenteritis specialist and look into it. Uh, most of the time when, when COVID causes gastroenteritis, it causes diarrhea and vomiting. You know that there can be um, ionic imbalances in some folks where the uh, GIT becomes uh, sort of stopped and then constipation occurs as well. <laughs> Bernard says, who cuts your hair, Dr. Mubin? It, it always looks nice all through this. So it's my wife. <laughs> it's my wife who has been trimming my hair. <laughs> The only thing is that she has to make me sit down. So she starts saying, you need to get your hair cut. I'm going to trim your hair. And I say, no. And then the next day and the next day. And so five or six days later, she just makes me sit down. And then she trims my hair. That's very nice of her, though. <laughs> I'm a difficult one to get to the hair trimming. OK, so let's quickly. Uh, she's talented, yes. I think. Or she cannot, <laughs> she does not like me with all shaggy look. So she just took the matters in her own hand. So let's do this. I'm going to get rid of my mouse and have this thing here. And let's start. <clears throat> let's answer some of the questions on Twitter. We'll come back here. So this is the vaccine tracker. Now 168 million doses, 77 countries. 5.84 million doses a day worldwide. In the US now, 50 million doses, 1.66 million doses per day. So good progress. I still feel we are slow. We are almost in the middle of Feb. Um, once again, from a 
country's point of view, <laughs> Israel is still at the top. Look at this. 6.2 million doses. Again, somebody had corrected me from Israel and my apologies that I kept calling her a him. And she sent an email saying, I have always been a girl and now a woman. So my apologies. So she corrected me. And um, 6.2 million doses does not mean that it is that number of people because some of them are, are administered twice or had two doses. I, f I think that I, I read today that 90% of the um, elderly have been administered the doses. And so most of the infections are now occurring in the youngsters. So this is the vaccine. This also, in the end of this Bloomberg, this also is interesting. Some vaccines that are front runners, for example, Pfizer, BioNTech, it is uh, the trial is 44,000 people, two shots, storage minus, minus 70 degrees and 95% efficacy. So just give it a glance as well. It is interesting to see. Then are the questions. And here we are. I reached this far while preparing. And then I'm going to go back here and see if we can then track back up there. So Mentju says, how does regenerative therapy look? NAD plus and thymosine alpha 1 beta peptides look extremely promising. Dr. Matthew Cook. So um, I could not reach that point yet. <laughs> and I uh, just became too bored because the two folks that were talking just I I'm a visual guy. So I could not capture what they were saying. And I see your timestamp here. So Matthew, if you don't mind, I would look, at, I'll watch from that timestamp and see what they're talking about. Uh, KHKI says, curious, you often recommend melatonin. Does it do anything more than help you sleep? Second, does asthma meds such as Motilucast and Advair help control COVID related breathing issues? Thank you for your informative lectures. Number one, you're welcome. Number two, yes. So melatonin does more than just inducing sleep for us. And that more than that is the following. So if you see here, this is actually my talk. The, the title is melatonin. So I would actually request you to watch it. I have put the link in the description. But if I just go here in the talk, if you see here, what melatonin does is not only helps us with sleep, which is important, it also reduces the interleukin production, which is cytokine. So reduced cytokine means less inflammation. It also neutralizes reactive ox oxygen species, which also means less inflammation and less damage. And then it also reduces the immune cell counts. It reduces the production of new immune cells, which also reduces the cytokine storm-like behaviors. So generally, it is very protective. In addition to that, there is a mechanism that I really love about melatonin, and that mechanism I have discussed here. So if you see in this diagram, this is a diagram inside a cell. So what happens is that when we have inflammation, let's say because of SARS-CoV-2, because of the inflammation, our mitochondria sometimes get, gets dysregulated. And what happens is, if you see here in this diagram, in the top here, there are pro-inflammatory cytokines. So imagine we got the infection. Now our cells are making cytokines that are pro-inflammatory. Those cytokines block this, um, uh, sorry, activate this enzyme here called pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase, which in turn phosphorylates this uh, enzyme here, which is called pyruvate dehydrogenase uh, complex. When that becomes phosphorylated, this mechanism here that I'm showing is disabled. The result of that is that production of serotonin and production of ATP and production of uh, other uh, melatonin itself is reduced, which in turn causes a shift in the cellular metabolism towards a more damaging side. Plus, it keeps producing more cytokines. Now, if you give melatonin, what happens is external melatonin, which when it comes in such a cell where the mitochondria has stopped producing melatonin and ATP and uh, serotonin, external melatonin comes in and starts blocking this enzyme, this red enzyme at the top, which then unblocks this blue enzyme, and that restarts the mechanism inside the mitochondria, resulting in production of more ATP, production of more serotonin, production of more melatonin. All of them then 
suppress the production of cytokines. This is a beautiful mechanism. I love it. So this is how melatonin works. So it's not just for sleep. So good question. And then uh, continuing on, the American protector of journalistic freedom, are we wasting time with cloth masks? So I have done two or three videos. I put the links in there. The question with the cloth mask wasting time is mostly, uh, are we doubting the quality of the mask? If that is the case, yes. So for example, this cloth here that I have, a single ply of the cloth, this cloth is the dishwasher cloth. This is 50% effective in stopping the transmission. But if you double layer that, then the effectivity is up to 87%. And of course, surgical mask has up to 93% or more. So the question is quality of the cloth. I have linked a couple of videos from my own previous talks where number one, I've discussed the benefit of the cloth mask and comparison to surgical and N95. And secondly, what is the best material to use if you're making a mask at home? Having said that, if I try to empathize with your, your, with your message here, the masks that we are getting, I don't think they are tested masks. And that means we don't really know what is the quality of the filtration from these masks. If that is the case, then yes, it is possible that these masks are not as effective as we want them to be. But if I answer this question, that can cloth masks be effective, then yes, cotton, mixed cotton, single ply, 50%, double ply, about 87%. If you go into the videos that I've done about masks, in there, I have the links to studies as well. Uh, Nico Demo says, FYI, so, so this is, you, you guys are going to love this one. This is uh, um, NIH. So somebody had yesterday put a comment under my video and in which they, they had talked about ivermectin not being useful and has not been able to prove it. And then uh, thank you here, Nico Demo. Uh, this is actually from NIH. So this is NIH, look at this, this is February 11. So whoever was the person who commented about the Avermectin under my video had actually copy pasted text from here. So this is Avermectin um, by NIH. And what they have, they're talking about it, this is February 11. And by the way, talking about Avermectin, we will have Dr. Paul Merrick with us next week, Wednesday, but instead of six o'clock at four o'clock. So uh, he was saying that six becomes too late. He's on the East Coast and it is nine o'clock at night. He says, usually I am sleeping at that time. So I requested that whatever time he likes, we can adjust to that. And he said 4 p.m. is better for him, which will be his 7 p.m. So please remember next Wednesday at 4 p.m. Pacific time, we'll have Dr. Paul Merrick with us. We'll ask him more about ivermectin as well. But here is NIH. Uh, and by the way, I love Dr. Paul Merrick. I know people, some people become so upset when I say I love Dr. Phillips or Dr. Paul Merrick. I love them. That's, that's how it is. <laughs> so here we are. Proposed mechanism of action and rationale for use in patients with COVID-19. So they have talked about the possibility that um, ivermectin, the mechanisms that we've talked about, they've used them and then they said, it has really not been proven, one. Secondly, something that was really puzzling for me was this, two micromole. They said that the dose used in the original Australian study where they had used ivermectin in vitro, that means in a, in a test plate or in a dish, petri dish in a lab on the cell and the dose used was big enough that if it is used in humans, it will be lethal. At the same time, I think it's not about the dose. It is about, it is proven that this can do it. So now adjust the dose. For example, I always administer ivermectin in therapeutic dose. And even in therapeutic dose, I leave it at the lower level. So here, NIH is coming back and saying, well, they used a very high dose. And that dose is not possible to give in a human being, living human being. So it's not really going to be useful. 
And then they have given for the studies that are done, they have given following issues. Now keep in mind, I'm going to bias you here. My apologies for doing that. You can reject the bias, but I'm going to bias you here. And that bias is they have bam map That has a very small sample size. 400 total people, 100 on the on this drug and other 100 on various doses of the drug and 100 on the uh, placebo. And they approved bam map correct? So here we are also talking about, look at their objections. The studies about ivermectin, the sample size of the trial was small. Most of the trial, well, don't consider most of the trials. Take the one that has a larger sample size. You could take 100 people for bam lenivimab and then approve it. Why can't you take 100 people's sample here and be OK with that too? Various doses and schedule of ivermectin were used. That is fair. And the reason for that is that we have never used ivermectin in this way. So instead of saying various doses, you use something, you take one uh, study, which has a number of people that you like, let's say 100, and then you see what is the dose there and say, we'll use this one. Some they Sometimes these guys, they behave like children. Some of the randomized controlled trials were open label studies in which neither the participant nor the investigators were blinded to the treatment arm. So what? What they're saying is this. If a study is open label, there is a sometimes a bias to say I'm feeling better. But guys, this is a situation where people actually, if they die, they cannot say I am biased and I'm feeling better. They're, they've died. And so... Yes, the doctor has a tendency and a bias. If they know I've given the medicine to this person, the bias is that doctor would work harder on that person to prove their point that this person is now going to be OK. So here, I think that most of these studies nowadays should be open label or should be with full protection. So what if the, this was open label? I don't have a problem with this. Uh, patients received various con uh, concomitant Medications, doxycycline, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, zinc, corticosteroids. This is such a stupid comment here because they should know better that doxycycline or hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin or zinc or corticosteroid, I'm going to leave it aside. They have nothing to do with ivermectin's mechanism. They are all secondary infection thing. Original study said that we have given ivermectin with, I believe, azithromycin and or doxy, I believe, one of these. And they said it helps potentiate the effect of it. Otherwise, these are all, for example, doxy or hydroxy or azithro. They can actually remove them and say, we would just look at the ivermectin. So this, once again, well, their studies had various kind of combined therapies. So we are not sure. The severity of COVID-19 in the study participant was not always well described. <laughs> the study outcome measures were not always clearly defined. <laughs> so th this, this is their objection. So includes, so then they have a leaflet that puts the studies forward and then, then they talk about it. Just for our discussions, normally what happens is the way um, some research comes together is that someone comes up with an idea to say this may this mechanism may become effective that may be an idea that they just thought up that may be some computer simulation nowadays that they did for some protein that may be some mechanism that they are good with for example as i think you can tell now i love mechanisms so sometimes i can think about a mechanism and say okay this mechanism might work here so somebody comes up with, an, with a hypothesis. Then what they do is they look at the literature to see, has this ever been proven? Then they might do a computer simulation, or they might do an in vitro test on some cells. If that works, then they go for uh, testing on, uh, on mice or, or murines. Once they have tested there, then they continue to move forward. And that is a normal process of creating any of the study. So here, if a doctor has observed something, then it is worth a try. 
the the problem is this i mean if i take nih and oxford from uk and their behavior when hydroxy was something that was thought observed that it works they just did such um incorrect uh, studies on them that they ended up saying it is of no use when where were they at that time with all of these objections and did they not know that they were doing the same similar mistakes in their own tests so it just looks to me that they want to dismiss it anyways then consideration in pregnancy they are correct in that that in animal studies it is supposed to be teratogenic that means it can harm in human studies it has never been studied consideration in children once again the same thing 15 kg and above are okay below that it is not tested properly contraindicated because of blood brain barrier so um, interesting one we'll come across this again so nico demo thank you very much how about we do a few live <laughs> discussions here as well um gem is here gem says thanks again i just got this test we'll see what is okay so something is going on uh, eric the dog says yes money talks absolutely that's what's happening uh, goldmuk says at no point do they address the somewhat obvious point that any that plenty of other approved medications and treatments still don't have a comp completely explained mechanism of action absolutely absolutely there are a lot diversity love says i need to dance and be loved and, and more puppies okay <laughs> uh, barbara says how do people get advanced degrees without ever having a single course in certain sensor design they apparently they do they do uh blue Indigo says, does daily low dose aspirin impact the effectiveness of the Pfizer COVID vaccine? I am in between doses. So aspirin, anti-inflammatory plus uh, antiplatelet or for blood thinning should have nothing to do with the vaccine's effectiveness because at the end of the day, it does not suppress the immune system. It just uh, re reduces some of the inflammatory responses. So no issues. Absolutely, Machiavelli. Nowadays, supercomputers can actually look for molecular interactions and say this thing would work. Ja John says, I love mechanisms too. Absolutely. Awesome. So you are. <laughs> yes, D Doug says some. Yes, but the other study is correct. So look at those which are not in these some and then use them. Correct. Nancy says, Dr. Mabin, you're funny. Thank you. And Jem says that INR. So Jem, INR is, uh, I would not, INR is a standard thing that you can track and should be tracked. Uh, so Tube Sterni, Sterini says, thank you for this critique of the NHL criticism. This is useless criticism. If you take their own criticism and apply it to their own approved drugs like BAM, then if, I am still surprised that they, again, no problem if BAM lenivimab is useful, even for one person. Yes, use it, approve it, but do the same thing for others too. Ivermectin does a similar thing, hydroxy does a similar thing. Use them. Why not? Okay, so some more answers here on the Twitter side. I'll come back here. Actually, here, art patron forever. Question, good news recently about budesonite. Any similar good news for bromhexine? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Bromhexine, poor thing, is always in the balance of, yes, it works. No, it doesn't work. You're welcome. So let me answer some more um, Twitter side. I'll come back. So Brooks Nelson says, question, how important is it to trial a drug in the country where it is approved for use 
Many critics of IVM Mectin trials say positive results in Bangladesh and Central America do not translate to USA. Thanks, Brooks. So, uh, Brooks, objections are for objections' sake. Uh, as I just said, the process of approving or looking at a drug starts with a hypothesis. Then hypothesis or our ancestral information. For example, my maternal side used to be doctors, meaning at that time, whatever, they used to be called Tabib, Hakim. So for 400 years, they used to be doctors. And so I remember that our mother used to show us big books, handwritten books, which would be from my grandfather and grandfather's father and so on, where they would say, I saw this plant and it the, the leaves look like this. And if you use them, it has this kind of effect and so on. So medicine was even in that kind of a stage where there was no scientific proof. There were people observing things. So if you think about it, the, the studies on drugs start from someone has observed that this plant is useful. Then somebody becomes curious to see what chemical molecule in there is that can be useful. Then you take formulate a hypothesis and put it on cells or, or give it to animals. From there, you slowly bring it to humans. Now, if a cellular at cellular level, you can prove something or at, let's say, mice level, you can prove something or at chimpanzee level, you can prove something. Why would it be a difficult thing to prove something in Bangladesh and then say it would be OK in the US as well? The, the problems can be, for example, socioeconomic differences that create lifestyle differences which are impactful for that drug or drug is impacted by them. For example, let's say you tested something which is tested in the folks who are not drinking alcohol. And now you're going to test it and some, give it to someone who may be using alcohol and you do not know the drug alcohol interaction. Fair enough, need to be tested. So those are the kind of things that can be different. But generally, if something is tested in Bangladesh or India or, or UAE or here, they should be fine. So they should be same. Please explain why lots of survivors are experiencing type 2 diabetes. Diabetes, can they recover? So very, very good question. And let's just very quickly look at this. So here is a, an article in NEJM, June 12th, so middle of the last year. And thank you very much for the super chats. I just am looking at them. Thank you. Uh, so new onset diabetes. The theories for this, let's just very quickly look at them. Number one, let's say we have, this is the pancreas. This is the pancreas. <clears throat> pancreas has beta cells that produce insulin in response to blood glucose. We know that pancreatic cells have ACE2 on them. So during an infection, it is possible that the SARS-CoV-2 binds with these ACE2 receptors, causes the functional behavior to change on the pancreatic cells and resulting in diabetes. That is one possibility. And uh, so let's say mechanism A. Ideally, if this has not destroyed all the beta cells, which I would doubt, then after the infection, the person should recover. It may be that they continue on for some time, but they would re recover. Second, B, stress of the disease itself causes the stress hormones, which in turn causes um, diabetes. This is why many people who are diabetic, they become more severely diabetic when they are under stress or infection. And similarly, number C, steroids cause diabetes or aggravate diabetes. So those who are using steroids, we know that they are if they are not diabetic, so not diabetic, they would maybe become diabetic for some time. And if they are diabetic, they may become aggravated. So all of these things, after the fact of the, the infection, they should recover over some time. I can tell you that in my own patients' cases, there have been many who are elderly 
and who were either diabetic or were at the edge when we started the medications and when they had the COVID, they became diabetic and diabetic diabetes needed to be managed. And I had always been consulting with the specialist on that side, but uh, do not, uh, don't very aggressively manage diabetes during this time because it is an artificial rise and a week or seven days is not going to cause chronic diabetic outcome. For example, kidney failure or eye failure or some other things. Having said that, after the disease is over, ideally diabetics so far from my patients, they recover and they go back to their previous state. For example, if somebody needed um, one metformin or two, then they go back to that. Or their levels go back to what, what they were before. Yes, if somebody had severe infection that caused destruction of pancreatic tissue, then it is possible that their diabetes will not be recovering to the previous level. We know that from SARS-CoV-1, now this is going to scare some folks, we know that from SARS-CoV-1, they were people who 10 years later became diabetic earlier than their age group. So for example, let's say somebody in their 20s becomes infected with SARS-CoV-1. And let's say they're not supposed to get in a, in a normal um, uh, epidemiology, they're not supposed to get diabetic in 30s. It may be 40s or 50s. They end up being diabetic in 30s. So there is some damage to pancreatic tissue that can happen, but it is not prevalent. So if you see this after this backdrop, if you see here, this is the June severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus, the virus that causes COVID binds to angiotensin II converting enzyme receptors, which are expressed in key metabolic organs and tissues, including pancreatic beta cells, adipose tissue and small intestine. So they say it is plausible that there can be damage. So that is one. Then, however, whether the alterations of the glucose metabolism that occurs with a sudden onset in severe COVID persists or remits with the infection resolves is unclear. So from a, a practicing doctor's point of view, I've seen it resolves in the patients. In any event, there is a site here, coviddiabetes.e.dendrite.com. This site is where you can actually go in and register yourself as someone who had COVID and has become diabetic, and they can request more information from you for their study. Um, so this is a good question, and I, I think that ideally, in theory, this should be temporary. But if the infection became severe enough that there was lots of organ damage, then pancreas can be damaged as well, causing diabetes. And that diabetes may not be reversible. Nicodemo says, could sertraline, a high affinity and putative sigma-1 antagonist, predispose one to cytokine storm if they are taking it for depression? Studies on it and its anti-inflammatory analgesic effects are mixed. So very simple one. We had this discussion yesterday that sigma-1's function is to block the uh, enzyme that helps produce cytokines in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So if I can quickly draw it. So I made them like snakes yesterday. So imagine this is the nucleus. With the nucleus here, we have the endoplasmic reticulum. This endoplasmic reticulum has, let's say, uh, endoplasm uh, ribosomes attached with it. And that is why it is called rough. Inside here, we have an enzyme. I made it look like a snake. <laughs> now it is looking like something else. So let's say this is a snake here. This enzyme's function was to help produce cytokines. And then sigma-1 is also resident of this area, and its function is to block this enzyme. So if you give an antagonist to sigma-1, then that would free up this thing, and this enzyme is then going to help more to make cytokines, that would mean inflammation will become more. So yes, sigma-1 blockers will cause, uh, will create a tendency to have more inflammation. Good question. 
Joe Smith says, can continuing to take zinc, quercetin, or hydroxychloroquine interfere with the vaccine? You've already said ivermectin will not interfere due to mechanism of, uh, of action. So let's see, zinc, quercetin, and hydroxy. So very good question. <laughs> so let's check them out. So here is a cell, nucleus, zinc, hydroxy's function, one function to allow the zinc to come back inside the cell, correct? And zinc's function is to work on cells uh, on um, viruses RDRP enzyme and block that. Now, va vaccine does not have a RDRP enzyme. So will zinc interfere with the vaccine? No. And zinc doesn't have anything else. In, ca in case of SARS-CoV-2, it doesn't have anything else to do here. Hydroxy. Hydroxy's one function is that when the virus is going to fuse with our cell membrane, it interferes with that fusion by reducing, by increasing the alkalinity of the cell or the pH is increased, cell becomes less acidic and it functions less well. So because of that, the viral fusion is reduced. Does this have a mechanism with the vaccine? No. So vaccine is not affected by hydroxy in this mechanism. Then the ribosome is going to work with the RNA of the virus to make more replications and hydroxy reduces that production of the new viruses. This ribosome is also going to be working with the vaccines that have messenger RNAs or DNAs. And so this part will be affected by hydroxy. If you're talking about a um, vaccine that is inactivated virus, then ribosome is not going to come into play. And so hydroxy will not do much. If you're talking about a vaccine like Novavax, which has just spike proteins, that would also not be affected much. So this is the basic functions. Hydroxy also causes a small part of the ACE2 receptor is not properly glycated in the presence of hydroxy, which reduces the bonding of the virus and the ACE2. And that has nothing to do with the vaccine too. So in my opinion, zinc or hydroxy are not going to interfere with vaccines function. Now you had one more thing here, zinc, quercetin or hydroxy. Quercetin is nothing as well, but primarily a uh, ionophore. And that has nothing to do with, ionophore means bring the zinc in and then zinc goes with the RDRP. Uh, once again, vaccine does not have RDRP. So no effect. Hydroxy may have mild effect, but nothing else. So that's a good question. Um, let's look at some of the questions on the live side. I'm sorry. I am. Uh, I wanted to go through some. So a study was published on diabetes. John Snyder says a study was published on diabetes this week. SARS-CoV-2 can infect the pancreas and damage it. Bunch of odd studies this week, especially bone marrow cells in the brain. Bone marrow cells in the brain? I need to see that one. So yes, so same thing. If the severity of the infection is such that the pancreas got damaged and damaged enough. So when does uh, type 2 diabetes occurs? When about 90% of the beta cells have been destroyed, that is when the diabetes occurs, at least for diabetes 1. Type 2 diabetes can be more slow because type Type 2 diabetes has nothing to do with the beta cell in the beginning. It is really the peripheral insulin resistance. So beta cells are fine. But if we wanted to create diabetes by damaging the beta cells, then 80, 90% of them will have to be damaged before a person has lack of insulin. So that means when the virus is present, it has to really cause damage to pancreas. That would mean there has to be a lot of pancreatitis that would occur as well. And that itself is a life-threatening situation too. So diabetes will be less of a problem and pancreatitis will be more. But yes, it is possible. Um, Eric says, any way to reduce the risk of getting anosmia, supplements or drug? So uh, most important thing is the reduction of inflammation. So and reactive oxygen species. So that would mean either, for example, melatonin or and or glutathione and or CoQ10 and or NAC. 
they would all help with that. This is the over-the-counter supplements with proper vitamin D and Cs. So that should keep the system balanced. But if you wanted to go for drugs as well, other than supplements, so then anti-inflammatory drugs should keep it under control. If you go for um, extreme measures, then steroids. Uh, Jenna has a question, follow up. I see online that of certain disease producing bacteria for my lab results, true? Jenna, is that a question to me? <clears throat> Diversity, that may be that the bone cells from the bone marrow, the stem cell travel out and go to brain. I have to see the study. I'm just... <laughs> thinking aloud. Uh, so Roberto says, I insist on it. Drug-drug interaction between ivermectin and fluvoxamine could be a very important issue. They both could be used simultaneously in a sessionatial fashion. Okay. I still have to do this um, uh, exploration, Roberto. John Ross Raya says, aren't we all going to get COVID eventually one way or another with, or, with our outcomes depending on the degree of help from the vaccine and our own DZ? So the <clears throat> vaccine will allow us to protect ourselves from the COVID disease, COVID itself. But to go with your question, are, aren't we all going to get SARS-CoV-2? Yes. So SARS-CoV-2 will be the infection, the pathogen. COVID will be the symptoms. So if the infection becomes symptomatic, then we call it a disease. So COVID is a disease, correct? So you are correct that even if I have vaccine, the point of vaccine is not that the SARS-CoV-2 cannot enter my body anymore. The point of the vaccine is that the SARS-CoV-2 is going to come in, but now it would be killed very fast inactivated very fast and I would not be damaged or killed by the, that pathogen. So yes, in general, everybody is eventually going to get COVID uh, or SARS-CoV-2. Okay, so I'm going to go back there as well and answer some more questions on Twitter. I'll come back. So Joe Smith says, so that is the thing we just discussed. Scott Robinson says, interesting that the standard of care in the zinc vitamin C study was do nothing. Should we expect zinc C to do anything? So I'm going to combine this comment with there is another um, comment here. Here, can you comment vis-a-vis -vis vitamin C and zinc to help prevent COVID JAMA effect? So let's look at this. I was actually, <laughs> so check this out. February 12, effect of high dose zinc and ascorbic acid supplementation versus usual care on symptom length and reduction among ambulatory patients with SARS CoV 2 infection. What they are saying is nothing would happen. There is no benefit. So let's look at it and think about it with me. Uh, sometimes I just like I was looking at NIH and I was kind of. Uh, amused a little bit. I'm sorry, I am amused here as well. Here is why. Zinc alone has less functionality. Just like when they would start testing hydroxy alone and, and people would say, guys, combine it with zinc. Similarly, if you just test zinc alone, somebody is going to raise hand like me and uh, cool beans here and say, guys, give some ionophore with it, maybe quercetin or maybe hydroxychloroquine. Zinc alone will not be able to do a lot to disrupt the RDRP. Secondly, ascorbic acid itself alone, for example, Math Plus protocol uses ascorbic acid, but ascorbic acid itself alone is not the final treatment for this. Who said that? Nobody said that. I My very first video, one of the very early videos was can, so if I go back to my channel, my 
manage videos maybe here so if I go here and I look for um, vitamin C I had done this talk COVID-19 inside could vitamin C help with COVID-19 April 5 2020 where I discussed the benefit of the vitamin C as an anti-inflammatory number one number two help against the reactive oxygen species who said that just reducing the reactive oxygen species should be a benefit or treatment for COVID. Nobody said that. Nobody said zinc alone should be sufficient. So on one end, NIH comes back and says, you know what? You did not have the right sample and right method and write this. And then here we have studies like this as well. And again, I, I am fine with the authors having a right to put those studies out because we should all look at them and see if we can make sense of it. So here is a study. What they said was, they said, it is a multicenter single health system randomized clinical factorial open label. So once again, remember, NIH does not like open label studies. So this is an open label study. 214 adult patients with a diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2. So 214. They are going to make them divide, they'll, they're going to divide them into four groups. So, well, the size is very small then, 54 ish people per arm outpatient. Let's see what did they do. Patients were randomized in a 1 1 1 1 allocation ratio to receive. Now, check what they're receiving 10 days of zinc gluconate. So, zinc alone, one group, vitamin C alone, another group. Vitamin C plus zinc, one more group. What is the com combination of these two? I have no idea. What were they thinking? So they were saying, all right, you know what, guys, we should do a study too. So people talk about zinc all the time and vitamin C, and why not we just combine them and do a study? They should have combined zinc with hydroxy or zinc with quercetin, do the right thing in there, and then see. Or if they wanted to do it, they combine ascorbic acid with methylprednisolin with... Um, thiamine and so on like math plus protocol try it over there so th this was just very interesting for me to see it outcomes so they said a total of 214 patients were randomized with a mean fine the study was stopped for a low conditional power for benefit with no significant difference among the four groups so now 50 people in each group outpatient groups um, who received the usual care without supplementation achieved a 50% reduction in symptoms at 6.7. So people who were not given these things, they recover, they got to the end point in 6.7 days compared to 5.5 days for vitamin C, 5.9 days for zinc, and 5.5 days receiving both zinc and vitamin C. I, I, I laugh, laugh because vitamin C and zinc have nothing to do with each other. So here is the study. And they said, well, this study means they don't work. Nobody said that they would work in this combination. So interesting. <clears throat> uh, so here then next one, Yagami's Nutsack says, I am happy to say that I have naturopathic physician who offers ivermectin upon request. My question is, do you think that do, do you think it is worth it to take for prophylaxis for someone who is in their 20s with optimal vitamin D levels? I'm a nutrition coach, so I'm good with vitamins, etc. So uh, my thinking will be no. In 20s, you are healthy. You are a coach as well. Um, you, you have your vitamin levels corrected. Generally, I don't think it is needed. However, if you took two doses, day one, day three in one month, and then next one month, day one, day three, that is just some extra protection. It has it has no side effects at this uh, dose level. Um, continuing on, I'll come over <laughs> to this side in in a one in one minute. Please give me so input. Very Jante says, is it true that post COVID antibody levels are correlated with disease severity? Doctors in my country claim that patients who had a severe case of COVID now have higher antibody levels and better protection against future infections. Could you comment? And then there is another question here. It is also said that those who had mild COVID symptoms 
need to be vaccinated because their antibody levels are low, non-existent, and therefore they're not sufficiently protected. What are your thoughts? So <laughs> input, beautiful question, but think about it for a second. Someone who could handle the virus with mild symptoms means they are very good at handling it. Doesn't matter what is their vitamin, uh, their antibody titer or level. They handled it well. They would handle it again very well. How can somebody claim that I got the infection, I did not even have lots of symptoms, and I recovered? How can a doctor then tell me that, guy, you are weak? I recovered with least symptoms. So I'm not weak. My immune system took care of the virus. So for the next time, if the virus comes in, it is actually going to take care of it even faster and in a better way because now it would attack it within 24 hours compared to seven days before or 10, 20 days. So uh, the basic way to look at such patients is how did they recover before? If they recovered fine, then they are fine. Doesn't matter what is the antibody level. They could have a cytotoxic T response. They could have better innate response. We've talked about it before. Now those severe patients, patients who had severe disease, they have higher antibody titers? Absolutely, yes. Why, why is the, that the case? What happens is the longer the um, uh, infection is in a person, that causes the B and T cells to keep dividing and proliferating. We call it proliferation, increasing in number, to keep dividing and increase in number. And so they would produce more antibodies. They would produce more cytotoxic T cells. They would produce more memory B cells. Does this mean that they are more protected than someone who had milder symptoms? Not at all. It simply means their body reacted more aggressively, almost to the point to kill them as well. So next time when this happens, would it react the same way? Yes, it would take care of it. Now within 24 hours, it would not let it spread that much. So it won't cause a cytokine storm like before, but they are protected too. And the one who didn't have much symptoms is protected too unless their immune system's health went down. They became immunosuppressed. Their bone marrow had a problem. They were given radiation or they were given um, uh, the uh, immunosuppression or they were given corticosteroids or they were given cancer therapies. Such cases, sure, they may need further management again. But both of those cases, no issues. And this is incorrect when doctor says that somebody who had mild symptoms is less protected. Well, that person recovered with mild symptoms. What else do you want? Um, one more question here. Garrett Jackson, can you comment? With a, so that's what we just responded. Could this just be too little too late? Uh, no, I think it is just that uh, they, they use them um, in a insufficient way. Ascorbic acid alone, that is like asking people to take high dose vitamin C alone and that should be fine. Yes, if it would have it, its effect, but that alone is not uh, sufficient. Similarly, zinc alone is not sufficient. So I'm going to answer these two and then I'm going to come to life because I did not see the ones above. So I'll look at those tomorrow. So there is one question here. This study proves it infects the brain. So Debbie Boss, I believe, Deborah Lynn Boss, you say autopsy results for testing virus in brain and parts of body is not legit because of blood brain barrier and vessel giving in at the end of life and after death. Can you please share research on this theory? So she wants a proof, which um, other than saying that these are all autopsies, I don't have any other proof. You also dismiss mice and organoid research for discovering viral infected sites. That I do not. I actually, many of my discussions have little cute mice that I make and I discuss them. So I do not know where I have dismissed it. So Debbie, if you feel that way, please share where did I dismiss them. And then uh, there is a longest recovery. This study proves it infects the brain in long haulers. So let's look at it together. So here is the study. SARS-CoV-2 infects brain astrocytes of COVID-19 patients and impairs neuronal viability. So let's look at it. 
Using an independent cohort, we found histopathological signs of brain damage in 25% of individuals who died of COVID-19. So there can be two outcome, two possibilities here. One is that COVID causes, it crosses blood brain barrier, causes brain damage and causes death. Or COVID does not cross blood brain barrier, but with the severe cytokine storm, many of the barriers are broken down as Debbie discussed as well. And then COVID enters all these tissues and in the autopsies, we find COVID in all those places. Then if you see here, we also found that neural stem cell derived human astrocytes in vitro are susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 infection through a mechanism that involves spike NRP1 interaction. So what they're saying here is, if you take astrocytes from the brain, put them in a Petri dish, if you take the astrocytes in lab, put them in a Petri dish, then put SARS-CoV-2 on them, then SARS-CoV-2 can infect them. That still is not a proof that blood-brain barrier will be compromised by the SARS-CoV-2 and the SARS-CoV-2 can actually cross the blood-brain barrier. It is still not a proof. And that doesn't mean I'm saying it is. it cannot be proven. I just haven't seen it. So let's continue. There is one more thing here. Then they say SARS-CoV-2 infected astrocytes manifested changes in energy metabolism and in key proteins and metabolites. Okay. Our data supports support the model where SARS-CoV-2 reaches the brain. And I, <laughs> this is such a beautiful thing, reaches the brain. What they're saying is our data is sh showing. So this is the brain. Remember, brain has blood. I'm just going to make a rough sketch on top of it. Brain has a blood brain barrier. Our data supports the model where SARS-CoV-2 reaches the brain, infects the astrocytes and consequently leads to neuronal death or dysfunction. Where have they shown their data reaching the brain? They took the astrocyte out. Here is the astrocyte. We took astro. We also found that neuro neural stem cell derived human astrocyte in vitro are susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 infection. This is not a proof that it reaches the brain. To prove that it reaches the brain, and in in living human beings, what we we have to prove is that it can compromise the blood-brain barrier. That is one. And then second, it is found in the brain tissue. And to find that, of course, you can't go to a living person and say, I'm going to do a biopsy of your brain. But you can still take their CSF out. And from that CSF, you can sometimes culture the virus itself, or you can find the viral uh, biomarkers or biomarkers of an inflammatory system. If this was happening, believe me, there would be a lot of news about it. Now I have one more thing. So I'm going to try to support you here. So not that I, I wish nobody would actually have SARS-CoV-2 in their brain. I don't want it. But if the research says it is going to happen, then it is going to happen. So at least this over here is not a proof that it reaches the brain and infects the astrocytes. This is not the proof. So let's see, there is one more study. This study, and I then saw a lot of, let me show you first the, the news articles. So let's say COVID crossing the blood brain barrier. Look at this. These are all actually based on this one study. This one study, everybody has spiced up in their own way to bring it up. So check this out. The S1 protein of SARS-CoV-2 crosses the blood brain barrier. COVID-19 virus enters the brain, which is wrong. Brain fog explained a study shows SARS-CoV-2 crosses the brain. This is the same uh, study, which I'm going to show you. And this is the people putting headlines on it. 
new evidence reveals that COVID crosses the blood-brain barrier. So let me actually, you can see that I read them, but let me show you those as well, just so that you and I are on the same page. Here, nature, and if you see here, severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 binds to cells via the S1 unit, right? And then they're going to talk about this study that spike protein enters the brain. Okay, so let's see one more. This one, Science Daily. This is the one I've opened. The spike protein, often called the S1 protein, dictates which cell of the virus the virus can enter. Usually the virus does the same thing as it binds the protein, said corresponding author William A. Banks, a professor of medicine at the University of Washington School of Medicine and a Puget Sound Veteran Affair healthcare system physician and researcher. Banks said binding proteins like S1 usually by themselves cause damage as they detach from the virus and cause inflammation. This is important. Why this is important is because the whole virus doesn't cross it. They are saying in this study they found in rats that the S, uh, S1 or the spike protein can cross blood brain barrier. I can actually agree with that, that maybe it is happening. But that still does not prove that the virus would enter the brain. And I would actually talk about it in a second, that if the spike protein enters, then what would happen? So please lead, read this. This is the author. Then brain fog explained as the SARS-CoV-2. Look, study shows SARS-CoV-2 crosses blood brain barrier. That is the heading. The spike protein of the virus, which is usually referred to as the S1 protein, is the key driver that helps the virus cross the blood-brain barrier. Actually, this statement is incorrect. They, I would show you the study, they did not say that the virus crosses the blood-brain barrier. They said the broken spike proteins or detached spike proteins can cross the blood-brain barrier. And that is understandable. Spike protein is smaller than the virus. So maybe it is detached when the virus is broken down and that small piece can cross. Even that is difficult to think, but still let us say that it can cross and it can cause inflammation and that would create some neurological symptoms. But this here is an incorrect statement. Then same here. Debbie, you had me go and find all of these. I wish nobody has it, but I'll continue to look. If you have some link as well that shows it, I would love to know it. And unfortunately, if that is true, then that is true. Um, again, this article, same study. University of Washington School of Medicine researcher in Seattle led the study which looked at how the coronavirus spike proteins behave in the mice. In mice, the S1 protein they found can cross the blood-brain barrier and grab onto the other cell receptors and maybe toxic to brain. It didn't say that the virus crosses the blood-brain barrier. So now let's look at it for a second. What they're saying is that they saw in mice, and no problem, I am not against mice studies. I was actually, um, <laughs> I got into an argument with the guy on Twitter because he said that the study that I mentioned was a mouse study, and he thought it is not the right thing. And I always think that when you are doing a study, you make a hypothesis, you test it on cells, then you test it on mice, then you test it on chimpanzees and other animals, then humans come in. So why would I discount my, my studies? So anyways, maybe I've said it somewhere. I would like to see that link or that reference. So here, let's say this is brain tissue. These are brain cells. And here, these brain cells, there is a blood vessel and the blood vessel, in case of brain, has the surrounding tissue that is acting as blood-brain barrier. And there are special transporters that decide what can get out of blood and go into the brain tissue. Right? So that is a blood-brain barrier. What they're saying is that it is possible that spike proteins can cross this barrier, this barrier, blood brain barrier and enter the brain tissue and if spike proteins can enter the brain tissue then they can be picked up by the immune system of the brain astrocytes and other such cells which are immune system of the brain itself and they can cause inflammation which is totally fine any infection viral infection 
or any antigen that enters the brain is going to cause the brain immune system to react and inflammation to occur, which will cause fatigue and myalgias and brain fog and all those symptoms that are seen in COVID as well. So that means it may be correct that the spike protein is entering the brain. That still does not say that the virus is going there. Now the question, if this happens, what can be the outcome? So first, let's see the study. In this study, they say, um, so if you see here, I actually had the study open as well in Nature Neuroscience. Where did that go? I think this is the study. This is the study. Yes. So here, what they say is that we, we saw it, that it can uh, cross the blood brain barrier. Now, let's look at what will happen. Where did the spike protein come from and what would it do inside the brain? So let's say here is some tissue, maybe a piece of lung tissue. In this lung tissue, there is a cell. That cell got infected by SARS-CoV-2. That cell, when it got infected by SARS-CoV-2, the cell started presenting the pieces of spike protein on it that caused the immune system to become active immune system was there was let's say a cytotoxic t cell attached here as well that cytotoxic t cell killed this cell when this cell got killed the sars cov2 viruses in fully formed shape half formed shape were spilled out of it now they may spill some um what is that? The spike proteins. They may have the full viruses spilled out. Those full viruses will then be picked up by macrophages, which are in the nearby system. And these macrophages are going to break them apart and present them. These can also be picked up by neutrophils. Neutrophils are a little bit ir irresponsible. They can pick them up. And instead of just digest and break them, they can actually then release the broken pieces out in the tissue for the remaining immune system and lymphatic system to pick it up. But let's say pieces of the virus that includes our spike protein are released. Then those pieces would go to lymphatic tissue in the lymph node. So ideally in the lymph node and here, immune system cells should pick them up and digest them and clear them. But let's say that this unfortunate person has such a large quantity that this is not just happening. And so from the lymph node, the spike proteins are entering the blood because lymph node has incoming lymphatics from tissues and outgoing channels in the blood. So let's say eventually those spike proteins have entered the blood. From there, they can now, according to that study, cross the blood brain barrier and go in the brain. If they go in the brain, they will be then picked up by brain system cells, for example, astrocytes, which will release cytokines inside the brain, which will cause the brain effects, which could be depression, anxiety, myalgias, fo fog, uh, and all those things that we can see. If it is too severe, this kind of a behavior, it is possible that death can occur. If it is milder, then patient may have some neurological symptoms. Eventually, these spike proteins will be cleared out because spike proteins themselves are not sufficient to stay in there and replicate and cause the uh, immune system to become triggered forever. So they would be then cleared out. When these are cleared out, these cells should calm down and we should normally restore back. Now, if they had not calmed down before and there was a continuous supply of SARS spike protein because the person was really, really, really sick and they, the person was spilling a lot of spike proteins, then maybe, maybe there is brain damage that is not going to be corrected. So I'm just hypothesizing based on this information to try to say, can we create a permanent brain damage-like situation? Now, if you think about it in long haulers, they actually fluctuate in their symptoms. If they have a permanent brain tissue damage, their symptoms are not going to fluctuate. They're just gonna have some disability in the brain tissue, which would be forever. 
But if it goes up and down, that means there is not enough permanent damage and they are recovering and going down. That means cytokines are produced and re removed and produced and removed. Now, this study so far does not show that the SARS-CoV enters there. Now, that may be because I haven't done enough research. So if I say COVID, sorry, SARS-CoV-2 enters brain, enters the brain tissue. So how SARS-CoV-2, November 30. So using post-mortem tissue samples, a team of researchers from this Berlin have studied the mechanism by which the novel coronavirus can reach the brains of the patients with COVID-19 and how the immune system responds to the virus. So here, let's see this one. The olfactory mucosa revealed the high, highest viral load. And we saw that the study that I discussed, and I have that in one of my talks, they said that we took the scans of the olfactory area and we found out that the SARS-CoV-2 does not enter the nerve. Instead, it infects the epithelium of the olfactory bulb, which compresses the nerve, which causes anosmia and causes the um, glymphatic drainage issues. Now, maybe that is wrong. Maybe this is correct. But uh, I haven't seen again here spike protein, which is found on the surface of the virus. Anyways, I have to do some more research. Debbie, um, I feel that if you you think I do not, I dismiss mice and organoids, please share them. And this study at least does not prove that SARS-CoV-2 actually infects the brain by going in. Believe me, the way this virus is aggressive, if it enters the brain, brain doesn't stand a chance to, to resist this thing. It's gonna be severely affected. Okay, so I'm going to leave this here, the Twitter side. Are, are you still with me? <laughs> or was I just going on a rant? So here I am. Tell me how, how are things here. So Trov Lee says, what is killing the infection of cytokine storm? Infection or cytokine storm? Hyperimmune system equals response to SARS or spike protein reaction and interaction. So Trov, this is a great question. And I have been thinking and researching this for a lot. Here is how I think that, um, the, here is the answer in my opinion. The answer is both can do it. Here is why, so hear me out. We know that one of the top mortalities is folks who are immunosuppressed. So immunocompromised do not develop cytokine storms. So if the virus does not have a capability of killing, then immunocompromised should be saved because the virus is not causing enough damage and it is just sitting here or there and a little infection somewhere in the lung. But this virus has a tendency to just keep going. It is relentless. So I think if you let the virus itself just continue to do the damage, it can kill. Similarly, we are also seeing some healthy people who are not immunocompromised to also die because of the cytokine storm. Cytokine storm then results in the pneumonia of the lungs and the severe imbalance of the cardiovascular system, kidney failure, and that kills as well, the septic shock. So I think both ways a person can die from it. Jenna says, sure, I never do. Not typical tonight. I feel defeated. Don't don't be, Jenna. What happened? Trevor, question. Will updated vaccine be as effective against variants as the original vaccine was against the original COVID? Ideally, yes. So I was thinking about it today, that we need a new vaccine that is going to combat the variant. Does that mean that by the time we have that new vaccine, because it is going to take some weeks or months, we would have even more variants. So that, that depresses me. So Jenna, what is going on? There is a, keep reposting Jenna Taylor, copy paste details. 
Um, I hope I can help. Uh, Sepal Steve says, question, hi, doc. Have you heard about the use of anti-inflammatory med tocilizumab for the treatment of COVID? I think it's used for rheumatoid. Uh, treat, apparently, it prevents, yes. So, um, Sepal Steve, not only I have heard about it, but I have talked about it. So if I go here and I say, Tocili, see here, tocilizumab interleukin-6 receptor blocker. So interleukin-6 is released by the many of the immune cells to activate the remaining immune system and then activate the more and so on. So tocilizumab can calm that down and uh, reduce the cytokine storm. Uh, Gold Country Ra says for Janet Taylor, question, immunoglobulin G subclass 2 sticks out the most as it's super low. Also, the serum labs in today, a new result. Um, so, uh, Jenna, tell me this. Immunoglobulin G subclass 2 sticks out the most as it is super low. Uh, this is for the um, for SARS-CoV-2. Also, the serum labs in... Um, tell me more. So, IgG low does not actually mean much. That simply means that your immune system is not looking at the virus and is not continuously attacking it. That may be because either your immune system is ignoring the virus and virus is just continuing to bother the body, or there is no virus and it is just the immune system that is um, dysregulated. I have a question, Jana, for you, and that is, did you talk with uh, Dr. Bruce Patterson and did you do their labs? They have special biomarkers that they measure for immune system's behavior to understand, is it the virus doing it or is it the immune system just going bad? IgG low does not, it's actually fine. Low IgG means you do not have an active virus unless your body doesn't care for it. So Jenna says, yes, yes, it's low. Um, OK. And blood work is fine. Jenna, can you connect with me on uh, Twitter? Maybe send me a direct message. Terry Kaufman says, Dr. Bean, is there a cure for cancer that they're hiding from us? So this is a. I feel that there are some types of cancers for which we have very good remedies, and then there are some for which we do not. I was actually thinking to separate out into a different channel where we only talk about cancers, aging, hypertension, diabetes, and maybe a couple of more prevalent things, and only discuss studies for these topics and figure out how do we, what are, what is it that we are missing in mainstream or what, what is it that we are missing just in general for us to know. So uh, the reason I wanted to separate it out from Dr. Bean channel is that many of my students have been saying that, hey, you're just continuing to do COVID and you're not doing other lectures and we are waiting for them. So I thought I'll start doing some lectures here, which are for anatomy and physiology and other things. And in a separate channel, I'll start doing more of these lectures. If this is something that makes sense, uh, tell me and I'll do it. So Jana says IgG subclass 2, which is fine, Jana. So uh, that in itself, let me just very quickly. Um, and Jana, are you saying that you had the lab with Dr. Bruce Patterson? Let me, Jana, explain the. The IgG. So the, let's say here is a cell, and the cell has the virus infecting it. This is the virus. The cell is presenting it. We know the whole uh, process here, naive T cell, T helper two, T helper one. And finally, let's say we end up with the plasma cell, correct? So plasma cells start making IgGs. So that IgG 
in the acute, it, they would make IgM, then they'll class switch and they'll make IgG, then they'll class switch again and so on. So in the beginning, at least for SARS-CoV-2, IgM and IgG, they are both produced together. Now, in the absence of the virus, or when, when the virus has been taken care of, mm -hmm. then their levels go down. But the memory cells are still sitting there. And if the virus appears again, then they, they're going to go up again. Not the IgM, but IgG. Unless the virus is a new variant, in that case, it will be IgM as well. So if you measure in this area, the IgG will be low. That simply means, one, your body knows the virus. It has the IgG, but the level is low because there is no virus. That is one possibility. Other possibility is that your body has started being energic to the virus. Energic means tolerant to it. That means the virus is there somewhere. And it is being presented as well. But immune system connects with it and then says, you know what? I don't care. I'm going to leave it like this. Like Bruce Patterson that day when he was talking about virus hiding in monocytes and the immune system not bothering, not caring. If that is the case, then at a low level, the virus can continue to bother the immune system and immune system would continue to produce at a low level the cytokines, which will then cause inflammation. Then the regulatory system cells would suppress that system and the inflammation would go down. Then the virus is still active and it's going to still amplify the immune system and the symptoms will come back and this would just keep fluctuating. So that is a possibility. The important thing to note is that can we ask Dr. Bruce Patterson to look into the monocytes, the biomarkers from them, the biomarkers from cytotoxic T cell, the biomarkers from the B cells to see what is it that is dysregulated. What happened, Doug? Oh, so she's talking about the total IgG tests. I'm sure not SARS-CoV-2. That's what it looked for determining. I see. So Jenna, can you please uh, connect with me uh, over? Um, Twitter so we can discuss a little more right I, I want to make sure that we don't discuss your situation that openly here uh, <clears throat> Gary Ann McIver says question dad in hospital with COVID pneumonitis and lymphopenia clinical COVID but no swabs positive Oxford vaccine three weeks ago any theories short-lived virus phase yeah so looks like if the virus is not positive, then it looks like the viral phase is over. Three weeks is sufficient. It can be over earlier. And then um, the cytokine side or the inflammatory side is there. Um, how is he doing? Meaning, is he in a moderate type state or, uh, God forbid, uh, severe? Mr. J says, am I immunocompromised or high risk having no large bowel total colectomy? No. Why would you be immunocompromised? Jenna, <laughs> you have my uh, Twitter. If I stop your, uh, this is my Twitter, Dr. Bean Medical. Just reach out to me. We'll we'll talk about it. Don't don't be disappointed you have igg covid got it got it island man says that thank you <laughs> okay uh, luffy is upstairs today 
uh, Rajat Talwani says, do you think that an over uh, an over optimistic scenario, over optimistic scenario of the variant not getting evolutionary dominant at all might come true, unlike these speculations? So that is what my hope is that if it is becoming more spreading, more contagious, then it should become less virulent and less lethal. And if that is the case, then it is actually fine to spread faster so that it creates herd immunity faster. Doug says we don't tweet. OK, so uh, <clears throat> Jenna can't tweet. OK, so let's do this. Jenna, uh, I'm going to show you my forum. I need some place to um, reach. Do me a favor. <clears throat> this is an email that uh, I can't actually respond to everyone on this one. But maybe uh, send an email to me, Jenna, at support at drbean.com. And then we can we can exchange maybe emails or something and we can talk. I'll ask my support team to just tell them that I am Jenna and Mubeen asked me to send the email to this email address. And from there, I'll take over. Um, Steve says, Dr. Bean, do you have any patients at Fubox? No, I don't. No, not, not for a while. I'm starting mine on it. I would be interested in seeing the results. Nora says, my result appears inconclusive. So what I do? Also, I'm in home quarantine because my family tested positive for COVID. Nora, it really is the clinical symptoms and the result to be combined together. And then um, just quarantine for the time that is necessary if your family is positive as well. Fishtail says, question, why is quercetin listed on Medscape as a drug which could have an interaction with ivermectin? So this is something that I have to, we talked about it yesterday as well, that it looks like the G glycoprotein uh, transporter, which is necessary for ivermectin, is impacted by quercetin as well. So uh, we'll talk about that one piece separately. And I want to make sure I've taken that note. I had taken it down. I'm going to take it down again. Ivermectin and quercetin interaction. OK. Um, thank you, John. Jen is awesome, so we'll we'll do whatever we can. Um, <clears throat> reverse translation is possible as reverse transcription is. <laughs> reverse transcription means from RNA to DNA. Reverse translation means from protein to RNA. That is not possible. Yes, we have uh, various computers that can think about looking at the amino acids and then how to construct the RNA. But in our cells, there is no mechanism that will pick up a protein and then disassemble it and look at the protein's amino acid and then have some enzyme make RNA for it. That's not possible, at least not known so far. Joy says, I'm a new admirer of you and your kitties. Thank you very much, Joy. Um, so David says that thoughts on the Apple Watch that can tell if a person has COVID-19 seven days before the symptoms. And yes, I talked briefly about that yesterday as well. Uh, let me give you an example. This morning, somebody called me about their own COVID experience. And yes, that reminds me, if Phil Lee is here, Phil, if you would like to discuss your COVID experience, I'm happy to have you online just like Dr. Paul Marek, and we can discuss it. So thank you very much for saying that you can share it, and I would love to have you. All right, so back to the question here, Apple Watch. So I was talking with someone, and they said that the way it started was that a week or so ago, before the symptoms, they started becoming breathless, and they started having tachycardia. And for six, seven days, they kept working. He works in a post office. So uh, they said that I kept going to the post office. I never thought I have COVID. Then one day sitting in the post office, my heart rate became very fast. And then I said, my heart rate is fast. My colleagues 
you know, they tended to me, they looked at my heart rate and they asked me to go home. Uh, somebody brought him home. Then he developed fever as well. Then he went to emergency. They did COVID test and he was positive. So now for seven days before, he had erratic heart rate. And the reason for that must have been that he had issue with oxygenation. And as he would walk or he would do normal activities, he would become breathless. And one outcome will also be that heart rate would change to compensate for less oxygen. And so they saw that because the Apple Watch, if you see here, if I go to my watch, I think everybody probably knows that Apple Watch the whole day long, it keeps taking your um, graph for your heart rate. And it keeps telling you that your most heart rate was this and less heart rate was this. And during the whole day, what was the activity of your heart rate? So they saw that the Apple Watch could detect a change in heart rate in those people who then seven days later became symptomatic. And that could be seen six or seven days earlier. And that is possible. And it's actually a beautiful thing. Maybe they can now create an app that at least gives you a trigger. Would it be always correct? That is not true. For example, if you start doing more exercises, your heart rate is going to start becoming up and down. And now if the watch doesn't know that you're doing exercises, it might think you have COVID. So it cannot really identify COVID. It can identify COVID-related heart rate changes or just heart rate changes. Uh, John Snyder, thank you very much. Um, Trumaka says, why so many different versions of vaccine with so many different rate of effectiveness? Do any of these vaccines prevent transmission? So why so many vaccines? Because so many companies want to earn money and so many companies want to help as well. So that's why. Uh, why different effectiveness? That depends upon what is the vaccine's formulation, what is the adjuvant level, what is the spike protein structure, how, how badass it is to trigger our immune system. Now, do any of these vaccines prevent transmission? Um, some vaccines have said that we are effective up to this percent in tra preventing transmission. We have done this discussion in the past as well that to prevent transmission, which is called sterilization, um, a vaccine has to produce enough immunoglobulin A and enough immune system behavior in the mouth and nose area that when the virus comes in, it attacks it and just sterilizes it right there. And now it cannot get out anymore. So can they do it? In theory, yes. Will they always do it? I don't think so. Jana says, where is he located, Dr. Bean? Far from Florida. Um, are you talking about me? I am in uh, Cupertino, California. <laughs> Trevor says bad aspects. <laughs> Look the same for yes. <laughs> uh, Pamela says, do anyone know how I send a question to him live? So you just wrote a question. So <laughs> comments, so just write, convert that into a question. Um, Gran says, dad doing well now, day five, he's 80 years old, sat was 79%, wow. Uh, pyrexic, though he won't last till ambulance, had oxygen, dexamethasone, remdesivir, toxicin, concurrent bacterial infection. Yes. So if he's stable, that is a good thing. The oxygen saturation looks low. Um, so... Ronald Johnson says, what do you think of the Merck press release that says ivermectin does not work? A couple of ways to look at it. One way to look at it in a more conspiratorial way is they just got three, four hundred million dollars worth of approvals to sell COVID treatments. Why will they want a cheaper thing to be approved? So that is one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is that the way... Um, ivermectin has been used in the past, has been therapeutically given once in three months or six months or a year, not daily or not twice a month and so on. And so some folks had been um, 
challenging them saying, were you okay with ivermectin when it was given out for river blindness? The problem is it's not given out on daily basis for these things. So in one way, they are correct in saying, we do not know what is the safety outcome of it. And don't come back suing us that this is your drug nowadays. It's actually a free patent is removed. Um, don't come back to complain us or, or we being the innovators of this and inventors of this. We don't think it is uh, used in this way. And that is fine. So in my opinion, they have one um, hint of truth in there that they do not know if it is used in larger doses and in higher frequency, what is the outcome. And on one side, they also have a bias as well. Anthony says, can you discuss function of interleukin-2? My second panel with Patterson came back just about normal, IL-6 interferon gamma, CCL3 were massive, now normal, IL-2 was low, now high, which seems to mean T cells working. Yes, and IL-2 also, so if I very quickly draw this, let me share my screen. <clears throat> so the macrophage, naive T cell, T helper 2 plasma, T helper 1 cytotoxic T cell, and this T helper 1 releases IL-2. And it can be released from here, from the innate arm as well, and from other cells too. So what this means is if T IL-2 is increased, that means both the innate arm and the cytotoxic arm may be functioning. Now, why are they functioning? Is it the SARS-CoV-2 that is doing it? Is it a different infection? Is it some other inflammation? We don't know that. But we just know that some innate arm cells and some T helper cells are active. <laughs> Closet picker says, I'm late. What did I miss? <laughs> The, the session. <laughs> so Mike Pellegrino says, any indication that COVID or the vaccine make you sterile? No indication like that. However, I have promised to the cool beans that I would talk about any female reproductive system issues. So I will talk about that. Um, I did uh, two or three days ago, I did a talk about testicular damage, possible or not possible testicular damage. And I can quickly show you that. Maybe look that up before I also talk about the female reproductive system and the effect of uh, this. So testicle. So if you see here, sorry, this is the testicular damage and infertility with COVID. So this was done a few days ago. So if you can please look this one up and I promise that I would talk about the female reproductive system as well. Uh, Anthony says, great news, maybe I'm not immune suppressed anymore. Th so production of IL-2 is an indication that T cells and innate cells are working. So yes. <laughs> Jenna says, closet is having a pretty party. You're fine. J uh, Jenna. Um, Terry says, Dr. Bean, your lighting is looking great. The lighting is awesome and improved since early pandemic. Yes, the camera has changed as well. Lighting has changed as well. So uh, one, there is one bad thing, and that is that this is a Nikon D750. And so I had to use this to, I had to use a converter to convert it like a webcam can feed and then get it to my laptop. So there is a audio delay because this mic directly feeds into the computer, camera feeds through a converter. So there is a delay between them and I have to figure out how to correct for that delay. So there is a delay in the voice. Some cool beans have really not been happy with that. Jody says that I think Africa's low COVID death levels are a proof once a year ivermectin works pretty good. 
I think that uh, these, at least that study that said twice a month has been great for prophylaxis. We should at least have that. Uh, Jayashri says, camera is good. Why Israel, uh, Israel COVID numbers are not reducing in spite of good vaccination numbers? That is interesting. Um, I actually am going to request uh, Leah to talk with me from Israel and give us some more clues. Uh, so if I go here, let's say, <clears throat> world, of, you can tell that I keep looking at Israel's numbers just because they have uh, lots of people getting vaccinated. So here, total cases are still going upwards. Um, total new cases are not going upwards, but they're not that drastically going down as well. I was hoping they would come down like this and then just flat out stop. Uh, active cases, if you see, are going down. Number of deaths, unfortunately, are still not declining. This is the number of deaths. It is lesser than this kind of a peak, but I would say trending downwards. So why is this happening? I have no idea. The, the news that I read today was that about 90% of the elderly have become in, uh, vaccinated. So most of the infections are now in the youngsters. If that is the case, then fine, number of cases could be more, but the deaths should not be. And maybe within the next couple of weeks, we would see that number of deaths would go down. Um, Truth Seeker says, going to say good night to everyone. I'm wiped out tonight. Good night. Ruby Zaret says that you're talking with someone. Um, Jayashri says India is doing very well. That is correct. We saw India's um, graph a few days ago. Trevor says India's, Israel's hospitalizations are down 30 percentage. That is a good thing. And that actually is an indication that the elderly population is now protected. So Terry says, is ivermectin working on South African strain? We have done this discussion. It would work on all strains because it has nothing to do with the spike proteins. It uh, hinders the virus cargo to the nucleus. It hinders the RDRP. It hinders the three chymotrypsin-like proteins. So all of those are uh, independent of the variant. Oh, wow. It is 7.47. So art, art patron forever. Can quercetin plus lutein blockade SARS-CoV-2 infection by inhibiting enzymes cathepsin L and 3 CL Pro and inhibiting? Yes, so that was the idea. The that was the idea that the bromhexin would actually work in that way too. Although those studies have not shown the results that way, but mechanistically, yes. Debbie says uh, IL-2 staying increased could be because virus isn't cleared yet, right? Possible. It is. So that is why I said that I do not know why IL-2 is still high. Is it this SARS-CoV-2? Is it some other uh, virus or uh, inflammatory reason? Is it an autoimmune reason? But yes, IL-2 is secreted from innate arm or cytotoxic T arm when they are responding to some immune event. This could be a dysregulated immune system as well. This could be a virus as well. It could be a different virus to our infection soon. <laughs> Carrie says, Dr. Bean looks like a movie star in the lights. Thank you. <laughs> Doug, Doug says, you're using a laptop. So yes, Doug, so I think I would make a video of how my setup is. But here I have a, this is a, uh, Mac laptop, rather oldish. Now I need to change it. Um, this is a Mac laptop. And then over there, I have my Nikon DSLR camera. Below that camera is a TV, which has the HDMI out. So I can see what, what am I looking like? There is a light here. So this, if you see, um, 
there is one light here, but it is non-key light, so it, it has less light. And there is a light here, so you can see the shadow from this light, and this is the key light. Uh, I just don't have the diffusers on them, and because of that, if you see my eye glasses make very sharp uh, borders. So I'm going to fix that at some point. And this is my um, drawing tablet here. And here is my mic. So that is the setup. So uh, John says, is your setup ergonomic? Yes. So under my feet, I have an, a thing to elevate my legs. This is an ergonomic errand chair, I believe. My desk is also something that uh, I can use to stand up as well. So, so far, so good. And for the mouse pad, I use this. The only problem that I, I use this for about a year now for COVID lectures, these discussions. And what happened was my finger, this finger has developed arthritis because I had been using this to press on it and draw. And that has created a permanent pain in my index finger in this joint. So nowadays, what I do is during the day, I don't use it. I keep it in a separate place and I use actual mouse. So that has reduced this pain. Um, but during the this talk, I put this back in because there were some cool beans who uh, said that they did not like the mouse's sound. So that is how I kind of keep my <laughs> ergonomics going as well. <laughs> so Eric says, what software do you use? So I use this software. Um, let me show you. This is called Mischief. Mischief, it's a beautiful story. Mischief was a software, if I say, view all strokes. If you see here, it is an infinite canvas software. And what that means is, I can um, bring it down to as much as I want and or zoom it in. It's a vectorial vector-based software, so I can zoom in as well. The problem is that if you make too many strokes, it becomes very slow. And me being an engineer as well, I know what is happening. I've, I've read the patent. They have a patent on this. This was an MIT's professor who uh, created the basic technology, and then they sold it. The patent is that what they do is they take this stroke. So let's say if I make a stroke here, let's say this is the stroke. What they do is they take this stroke and they create small um, samples of it that how would it look in a small way and how would it look in when it is blown up. And they keep a 40 or 50 samples. And then as you're zooming in and out, they kind of traverse between those samples and extrapolate the data. So because of that, they can go infinite, small or big. The original uh, software when I purchased, it was, I think, $25. Uh, then the company went under because the thing that is missing in this software is filling. You cannot fill this area uh, with fill you have to draw on it by yourself. And so of course, that means you cannot create a very accurate drawing with the fill. I actually like this small lack of accuracy. I love it. Um, so they could not become mainstream. And finally, they got acquired for a few million dollars. This company, this technology is used in another technology and that person has now moved on to become a teaching professor. So if I show you here, mischief acquired by, I think MTVI group, mischief new media was acquired by MTVI group on March 8, 2000. So the, sorry, the foundries, foundry, this is the one. The foundry acquires made with mischief. So this was the software. Nowadays, of course, this is now a deprecated software. However, um, it is still available. Uh, on Reddit, if you go and uh, search for Made for Mischief, you can find the license key for it. I had paid for it, so I have my own license key. But on Reddit, there is a license key, 
and you can get that and you can have this uh, this software work i love the software so sorry for So, Sepal Steve, so another couple of questions, then we stop. Sepal Steve says, any adverse effect for taking NSE for a long period of time? Just curious. Um, no, other than it it really smells bad. <laughs> but I have, I've been using it for a long time. I don't see any side effects. Jen says, I'm surprised COVID did not spring technology that users don't have to touch. I actually think it would happen. Um, I think there is going to be a maturity even after COVID in that direction. Laura says, I'm itching for ivermectin. <laughs> um, Navinath, Navinith, Vishnu says, Good evening, doctor. Have you heard of a new chemical entity from India for COVID named PNB001? The company PNB Vesper just completed their phase two. No, Navinith, I have not. Navanith, can you send me a link for them? So Rajat says, I can't wait to learn something non COVID related from Dr. Bean, especially in neurology and cardiology. Hope this next pandemic ends. Absolutely. And Rajat, just for uh, um, for for some fun, if you like, if you go to Doctor Bean, uh, COVID is the new thing. But I have a lot of immunology and cardiology and respiratory system talks already here as well. And I think that if you are comfortable, we are going to start a separate channel with some other topics too. Cool. So, so let's stop for today. Guess what am I going to say? <laughs> so Art, Patron Forever says, is there a Dr. Bean medication protocol you may list? Please link. Thank you. I have never put that protocol together to list it. I have usually been just banking on the iMath Plus or iMask Plus. However, uh, I think my protocol is slightly different from them. I should put that together. Thank you. Doug Ross says, why stop? Um, <laughs> we've been here for two hours. I would love to continue going, but some rest for today. Maybe tomorrow we can continue. Um, thank you. Cool. So, um, let us stop for today. Uh, please like, subscribe, and share. Please like, subscribe, and share. And if you would like to support this work, there is a link in the description to be my patron. There is another link if you wanted to buy me a coffee. And there is a link to support me if you like. So thank you very much. I'm a little shy in asking for those things. So do whatever, whatever you like. So this is good. Sandy says, how about bean in a nutshell to summarize the points? I think we should do it, yes. <laughs> cool. All right, guys. So thank you, everyone. And see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.